let's begin our webinar, Solving Data Challenges in Financial Services. I'm Mike Grove, one of the founders and VP of engineering at Stardog. I've been working in the data, graph, and AI space for most of the last 15 years. And a lot of that work and experience has gone into helping architect the Stardog knowledge graph. Jacobus, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my, I'm Jacobus Gulluk. Um, I, uh, like Mike, I'm also working in the semantic uh, data space for quite a, quite a while now. Worked at uh, JP Morgan uh, and Bloomberg, uh, BNY Mellon. Uh, worked on the uh, knowledge graph projects in all these uh, companies. Um, I'm also um, uh, heavily involved in the EDM Council, working on FIBO, the financial industry business ontology. And uh, recently uh, founded a company with uh, a, a lot of other people to uh, focus on enterprise knowledge graph um, in the most in the broadest sense. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so let's quickly go over the agenda uh, before we get started. And we have a lot of great content lined up for you over the next hour. I'll start off kind of discussing some of the current data challenges, um, do a little bit of introduction into Knowledge Graph, um, you know, how they can help. Yukobus will kind of take the baton from there and talk about how Knowledge Graphs can be used in financial services, go through a maturity model, and time, if time permits, we'll go over a few case studies as well at the end. So with that, let's begin. A big part of digital transformation in the enterprise comes down to any number of data-driven initiatives. Um, AML, Customer 360, Predictive Analytics are, are amongst them. And perhaps not surprisingly, data is the fuel that that makes those things go. Um, and fortunately, you know, there's an industry trend as displayed here that's working in our favor. Um, there's just an explosive growth in terms of total data volume within the enterprise. But that data growth is a double-edged sword. You know, on, on one hand, we have, or we are approaching a critical mass of data to power and back up our data-driven initiatives. So that's great. Uh, but on the other hand, we have a critical mass of data. And we have so much data that it, it's actually quite challenging to handle it in any sane manner. And it's not just the total volume of data that's a challenge, it's the variety of data. And that's perhaps the biggest vector of the data growth that we see is along data variety, just even with unstructured, the amount of variety within that specific subset of the data domain uh, is quite astonishing. You know, and you know, the way we try to address this is mostly through data silos. Um, so the best efforts that we have available today to deal with the reality of the enterprise data ecosystem, you know, lakes, warehouses, content specific silos, um, you know, they're really just making the problem worse. So we wanna use all of this data, uh, but we struggle with making it available to those who need it. What that ends up looking like in practice is that, you know, we see the kind of the painful life of the data scientists where, you know, they're spending 80% or more of their time not actually doing their job. You know, instead, they're spending it struggling with that data access. They're wrangling and munging and wrestling and otherwise beating into shape a data set just so with whatever precious hours they have left, they're able to do actual data science. Another way that you know, we see the challenge here, um, and perhaps a, a more concerning way that the challenge manifests itself, is what's often the canonical data-driven um, project, Customer 360. You know, these types of issues are very important to these organizations, and you know, they understand implicitly what analysts are also saying, is that you know, organizations that use their data effectively do better, and you know the converse is true. If organizations are unable to leverage their data, they don't have the be the best business outcomes. So as you know, we see in a, a recent Dun and Bradstreet article that most organizations are are struggling with the amount of data silos that are within their walls, and because of this, 
building that canonical data-driven customer 360 application, you know, most of those initiatives end up failing. We see nearly 70% of those not working out the way that those organizations had hoped. They ended up building customer 36 instead of customer 360 because the walls between those silos prevent them from being able to put together that single comprehensive view of the customer. And you know, this is the same kind of issue that plagues you know, what we were just talking about with data scientists. It all comes down to whether it's C360 or, or some other uh, objective, it all boils down to being able to have access to the data you need to ask the question over all of the data that's relevant. And that data is often spread all over the organization. So what these organizations need to do to effectively build solutions that power all these initiatives is to put into place the appropriate way to facilitate data access. You know, as I said, all of these things come down to being able to query all the data that's worth knowing about your domain. So we're gonna go ahead and launch a poll here. Um, curious how folks who are attending the webinar, if you're seeing a lot of these same challenges within your organization, um, then you know, if you are, you know, hopefully kind of some of this intro has resonated with you. Um, I encourage everyone to vote. See a, a few trickling in. Um, I'll report back on the, the results of that in a second. Um, as we get on to kind of the next thing here, as we, we start pivoting towards the appropriate solution to these challenges, um, you know, when you're making those queries, when you're the data scientist doing analytics, you're building that customer C3, C360 application, you know, all those questions, they're, they're from a business context. You know, an easy example is trying to put together all of the purchases made by customers in the mid-Atlantic region for over $100 in the electronics domain uh, within the last 30 days. And these are the types of the questions that the business wants to answer. And you know, at no point do they care about data silos or that wide variety of data. In fact, those questions presuppose that all the relevant data is in one place and easy to query. And this is why data matters and not its location. <clears throat> no one wants to know about the sales that take place only in the data lake or information that was only in PDF documents. You need to know all the relevant data because that's how you build a 360 degree view of anything. So it looks like the kind of early results for our poll is that you know, a lot of you are reporting connecting data silos and getting executive buy-in and integrating various types of, of data. So data variety are challenges that you're facing in your organizations, which is what we see. Launching another poll here as we, we jump into kind of the overview of the solution, um, knowledge graphs. Um, <clears throat> so curious how people, have, if people have heard of knowledge graphs before. Enterprise knowledge graphs have the principle of data matters and not its location at their heart. You know, the folks who need the data, the data consumers, whether that's data scientists, business analysts, application developers, you know, they don't care about where the data comes from or how it's stored and nor should they. They're helping answer the questions that the business is asking and, and hopefully creating value and not fighting some messy siloed ecosystem with a myriad of data sources and formats. An enterprise knowledge graph leverages a logical data model so that the language of your data and the language of your business come together. People, transactions, products, purchases, not rows and columns, not keys and values, or even nodes and edges. And it leverages that logical model to let the data consumers act as if the silos are not there. It bridges the many different ways we store data in the enterprise and provides a single coherent view of all of the data that's worth knowing. And you can do this while leaving the data in place. No disruption to business as usual, and there's no need to boil the ocean. You can unify one silo at a time into the knowledge graph and take advantage of the network effect of the ever increasing value of unified data becoming knowledge. You can see from our poll results, perhaps this is not new to anyone. 82% uh, of you are reporting that you've heard of the term knowledge graphs before, so that's really great to hear. <clears throat> Finally, to wrap up, 
graph is the right data model for the enterprise and knowledge graph is the right data infrastructure for that enterprise. It's because it focuses on what matters, the data itself, and not what doesn't, which is the silos where that data is stored. When you take this approach, when you stop worrying about the silos and even forget that they exist, and you embrace the fact that enterprise data is best thought of and, and utilized as a graph, you find yourself with the appropriate data architecture for your business. So while others fight silos and struggle with data variety <clears throat> and are unable to become data driven, you can be knowledge driven. Now I'll pass it over to my friend Yakobus to talk more about these challenges and how an enterprise knowledge graph can solve them within the financial industry. Okay, uh, uh, let me switch uh, screens. Uh, um, okay. Can everyone see my screen? I suppose you can. Okay, um, well, let's talk about uh, financial risk management uh, using uh, enterprise knowledge graphs. Um, that's just one area that you can cover, uh, but I think every bank uh, uh, is managing risk. Yeah? It's kind of the core process of every bank. Um, so there are many other uh, use cases. Here's some examples. Uh, these are what, what, what I would call the, the holy grail use cases. Um, they have uh, resisted uh, lots of attempts to, to solve them. Uh, like global uh, anti-money laundering, uh, for example, uh, firm-wide across all lines of business, across all jurisdictions, uh, customers that, ha that have uh, accounts in, uh, in Switzerland, Liechtenstein, or South Korea, uh, how do you create a, a unified view of that? And is that even allowed? Um, so th that is a major problem. Uh, KYC in the broader sense of the word, uh, or Client360, um, it's also everywhere KYC is basically a, a, a sub use case of, of, of full client 360. It's also something that I hear for literally decades. Um, and I've never heard of any company who, who implemented it uh, f uh, in it, the real 360 view of all your data. Like customer walks in for GDPR, for example, asks for all his data. Uh, where can I click on the link that gives me all that data? Um, I don't think that anyone uh, can, uh, is able to do that in a large enterprise. Um, Enterprise-wide fraud detection and prevention, uh, similar to AMLs, same thing. Uh, also a holy grail uh, use case. Um, and yeah, uh, conduct risk and, and especially stress testing as well, uh, uh, being able to to do what if scenarios basically in the uh, in future what if scenarios what happens after brexit uh, what happens after and in the no deal scenario or when the economy goes down for 10 percent uh, what would uh, what would happen uh, to the bank in that in that scenario being able to do that with the full breadth of all your all your data um, that is uh, well related to this uh, will be uh, for a holy grail for a long time to go um, but let's focus on the, on the managing uh, financial risk, which is a very broad term, uh, but we'll just highlight some points. Uh, but let's first start with uh, uh, the problem again, like uh, Mike already uh, mentioned it a little bit, but uh, we have um, this increasing volume of data. Uh, so batch jobs that need to be running uh, between uh, at, at night, but what is the night if you ever, I, I have a global organization, uh, how many hours do you have available uh, to to run batch jobs? Um, uh, so maybe it's six hours. Uh, what if your data gets so big that uh, that you won't we won't be able to to do it in that time window? Um, uh, would that uh, disrupt the business? And I think that's a, that's a risk that's becoming bigger and bigger. And of course, you can handle that with uh, with big data techniques, etc. But um, it's not just the the, the volume of data itself, but also the volume of uh, the different shapes of data, like the, all your the different shapes of data in all kinds of uh, lines of business, uh, the complexity increases so much that it almost sounds to me, it seems to me that uh, the whole financial industry and the IT departments in, the, in banks are slowing down slowly into a grinding halt basically in order to be able to, um, to, to de deliver changes. Um, then we also have the uh, the tightening rules of the uh, regulators, um, like um, 
BCBS 239 or SR14 or FRTB or GDPR, like all those new regulations uh, create another, uh, yeah, other pressure. Um, and all those regulators are start, starting to ask common sense questions. Can you prove where your data comes from? That you that it doesn't, can you prove that it doesn't come from a spreadsheet? Did you not compare apples to oranges uh, along the way? Did you aggregate it in the right, uh, in, uh, in, uh, with the right time series? In the, uh, was it, uh, did you have your bi-temporality, for example, in, in, in line? Um, uh, is, is it, is it processed by the authoritative source? Of, does it come from the authoritative sources and so forth? Those are just common sense questions that anyone uh, should ask, not just the regulators, but also the top of the house, all the decision makers should basically ask those questions as well. Um, and that is, uh, yeah, then compounded by uh, uh, the geographies, the time zones, and, and basically also a culture of 50 years of silo creation. Uh, it's not just a technical reason why we create all these silos, but it's also culture uh, in a big uh, in a big sense, I think. Uh, so that this this all relate created a, a cottage industry of um, half complete uh, data warehouses and spreadsheets and data lakes, which are basically collections of data puddles. I would say uh, you have uh, so much data, so much, so many systems on top of the layer of uh, authoritative source systems that um, um, I think um, it would be fair to say that about 50% of your IT budget goes into this uh, cottage industry. And then on top of that, you also have all the, yeah, the Excel people uh, trying to make sense of it. Um, then we have in all these systems, if, especially the ones in the cottage industry, uh, they're trying to make up for the quality of the data uh, by uh, having multi-page SQL queries or Java programs or complex ETL processes, uh, all kinds of hardwired or hard-coded uh, assumptions about what is the right version of the truth, uh, what is the right uh, version of the data, I'm trying to create one single version of the truth. Um, so yeah, we cannot interfere with business as usual. Um, we cannot interrupt uh, existing processes, we cannot get the time of people to, to work on higher level priorities, on, on long-term strategy priorities. Um, things that, like everything goes, it's, it's short term, people are swamped and, and busy. There's, it's very hard to, to, um, to, to change things in a, in a structural way or fundamental way. Um, and, and especially in banks, uh, it's, it's still very hard to use, uh, to leverage cloud. Um, uh, lots of systems still run on bare metal hardware or in, or in VMs, but not in the cloud. Uh, serverless architecture, like a, like all the fintechs, uh, can can leverage all these new benefits of cloud, uh, whereas banks are, uh, are lagging behind because their infrastructure doesn't keep up. Um, which is also like in, in my experience uh, a major factor of. Uh, uh, slowing things down basically it's very hard to to to, to get something running in a bank uh, where the infrastructure is bad um, then uh, what is also very necessary i think in order to create this enterprise knowledge graph is to have access to source systems uh, to uh, ideally you want to bypass that whole cottage industry of the the, the men in the middle systems and go straight to the source systems because that's where you find uh, the most granular data um, that's where you find uh, all the, v the various versions of the truth. Um, and um, basically you want to eventually uh, decommission uh, at least part of your, your cottage industry. So you need, to have ac you need to have access to those source systems. And um, I, I can uh, say that one of the critical success factors of a previous project that I did at a large bank is uh, that we got top-down support from the C at CIO level uh, that basically said, uh, give these guys access to the source system, give them access to the or original uh, data sources with JDBC access, so that you can read all the all the data, all the tables, and get the most granular version of the of the data. Uh, and uh, it will also allow you to 
uh, yeah, to, to do extreme normalization, basically, because that's what uh, what you would do in an enterprise knowledge curve. In order to create reusable objects, you have to kind of um, yeah, do extreme norm normalization, and for that you need access to the original source systems. Um, then, yeah, we can't boil the ocean, um, and that's basically what everyone always says. Uh, every use case uh, is implemented as a separate project. Uh, you put a team together, you build something uh, with Java and Oracle, etc. You run and, and you deliver a, pro a project, and then everyone runs away to the to the next project. Uh, so, use case by use case, uh, could potentially end up in yet another silo. So, we want to avoid that. We want to be able to still prioritize on a use case by use case uh, le level, but build up a it, it build build things up in a in a structure in in an architecture in and based on a roadmap that leads to implementing a certain vision. So I would like to uh, discuss that a little bit more here. Uh, but let's first do this. Uh, regulators have uh, issues too. Uh, the, the regulators uh, have basically the same, are asking, I would say, the same questions as the top of the hush should ask. Um, give me the right data uh, with the right quality, etc. cetera. Um, but they, their problem is that they have to deal with thousands of enterprises uh, sending them data. And so the need for standardization at that level is, of course, uh, much higher. Um, and that is where uh, ontologies like FIBO come in, for example. Um, no regulator wants to stop you uh, to, to doing business. Uh, there is common ground. And I don't think they, um, they, they put the pressure on too high yet. Uh, but you see that you see if you just Look at all these regulations. You see that there's uh, that there's um, basically they're asking the common sense questions, as I said, but um, they're not really enforcing them yet. So we are not you're not enforced yet to to provide full provenance of your data. But uh, if you just think ahead a little bit, then you can see that question coming. And at, at some point in the in the future, you will be forced to provide full provenance of all your data that goes to the regulator. So, and how would you do that? And how I, how can you prepare for that? Um, so there's an interesting example uh, that we heard on the uh, EDM Council uh, session uh, in October. Uh, it was a presentation from uh, someone who worked on the uh, the MAS 610 uh, Open Taxonomy uh, Initiative, which is uh, not necessarily a knowledge graph based solution, but it was based on uh, on the fibro ontologies um, and uh, basically an, an initiative bringing bringing a, a number of banks together to provide uh, one canonical model, one set of ontologies, basically for the uh, for the Singapore regulator, um, and that. Uh, and, and these kinds of initi initiatives give hope in that sense for you know, the regulatory side of things. Um, how can a knowledge graph help? Um, so, for example, you could you could start integrating uh, uh, risk types across the across the bank uh, and getting and leveraging the data that comes from other initiatives um, around risk um, and bring it all together in one place. Every silo has its own risk engine. Uh, and if you can tap into those uh, the, the underlying data structures of those risk engines, uh, then we and we can map it all together into one enterprise knowledge graph. Then you would be able to to um, to, to provide this holistic view, and verify uh, market data and model data inputs prior to calculation is also a, a big thing. Um, like uh, Mike already said, uh, data scientists are spending 80% of their time on, on by, uh, even getting the data, and that data is very noisy and messy and has to be cl cleaned up. The same can be said about um, uh, what, uh, the data that goes into uh, risk engine or risk calculations. Um, when there's uh, a problem with the input data, then uh, the, the whole calculation has to be started again. Uh, this, the problems are identified after processing. Uh, lots of these uh, data processing pipelines are not really built with uh, test-driven development uh, practices in mind, uh, where every little part of the, of the chain is, is being tested. Um, I would say if you would put the knowledge graph in the middle there, uh, make sure that all the, all the data from all, all that messy and noisy data from all those different sources gets first gets into the knowledge graph first, where, where we create a much higher level uh, of quality of the data. 
and then feed it from there into your risk calculation or into your uh, machine learning uh, uh, models, etc. That would eventually then also create uh, much uh, fewer breaks um, in the business, um, and it would allow you to to flag transactions with unusual parameters um, uh, on the on the input side. Um, and from from that enterprise knowledge graph, where all that data comes together, uh, where you basically uh, get rid of the idea of silos and data sources and systems, but you have one logical view, a logical model kind of view of your data, you can then much it's it's much easier to implement uh, new downstream feeds. So how do ontologies help? Uh, we need this uh, ubiquitous language um, to uh, to create. Um, uh, cooperation between uh, development teams and between systems, uh, which is not, I don't, don't mean to use the term canonical model here, uh, because canonical models, at le, especially at a large scale, uh, do, do not really work or often fail or take too much, uh, are, too, are too static and too strict and, and, make, and, and basically cause all kinds of uh, dependency problems between the canonical model and all the system that use it. So how do you how do you even manage uh, change change in the in the, in in, the, in that sense? I know of a large bank who uh, worked for ten years on a large uh, on a large uh, canonical model that was used by hundreds of systems. But how do you how do you manage change? Uh, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, so what we would like to propose is that uh, you you work on ontologies that are abstractions of data where. You can have your own specific operational ontology in your silo. I can have my operational ontology in my silo, uh, but we can still work together. We can still agree on the common terms um, and on, abstract, on abstractions of those terms. Is, let's say an ontology is in that sense, object-oriented uh, modeling in that sense on steroids. Uh, you have all these superclasses and expressions, etc. It'll, it's it's much easier uh, to 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 find common ground between uh, between two silos, um, and and it goes of course obviously much further uh, much farther than um, uh, than a data dictionary. So uh, another thing is uh, yeah how do we manage data lineage or or, or eventually even provenance and I think there are two flavors of uh, of data lineage so you have the the logical model level data lineage top down view uh, how how do our how is our data flowing through throughout the organization from system to system but then you also have the technical data lineage which is more like a bottom up view uh, with uh, where you can have crawlers etc that that scan your databases uh, where you use data catalogs uh, to to find uh, how data uh, is moved around, and and those two approaches need to be need to come together as well. And there are not many tools that can do that at the moment. I think a knowledge graph would be uh, would be great for that, and especially if you would like to then evolve it to full support for provenance, where you have basically that's your lineage at transactional level, uh, basically or event level for every event, every transaction, you know which uh, what the whole the whole story is basically. Um, um, so a knowledge graph can uniquely track that lineage because it has that holistic view. And it allows an analysis of data flows and optimization of data flows as well. Um, so how do we get from here to there? And I would say um, the most critical, the, the most important success factor for a successful uh, enterprise knowledge graph project, if you really want to get it in production, then you need to have top level buy-in, uh, preferably from at from at sea level uh, of the bank. In, in my previous uh, company uh, employer, uh, BMR Mellon, I had the support of the previous CIO. Um, who basically said, I give you two years of time to do this and I want a knowledge graph. Uh, and, and that that changed everything. That's, uh, that was uh, that was the, the most uh, important thing uh, for me to, to be able to do this. Um, and I think uh, making sure that you have your story right uh, with, with at that level, uh, this is basically one of the one of the primary things to focus on in the start, like uh, create a strategy or a vision. What is the vision? Translate it to a strategy, translate it to a roadmap, um, and, and then take it from there. Um, I would also say try to 
build the system alongside existing systems. Don't uh, don't cause any disruption or uh, no downtime. And we're not going to replace any other systems. We're not at that level yet. We're just starting uh, with a, a, per, a system in parallel uh, and uh, give me your data when we will store it in the knowledge graph. Uh, leveraging uh, existing nightly batches is, is, is a practical way to get data quickly. Uh, the only thing that I uh, would say about it is that usually in, in uh, the output of these batches ends up in some data lake or in an S3 bucket or in a, in a data warehouse. Uh, and you might end up with two coarse grained uh, data. It's not granular enough. Um, and um, you might, you, you, in some cases, you might waste your time uh, like, uh, because you want to have the most granular version of your data. Um, so if you can avoid using uh, those batches and go straight to the source system, which is a, a mandate that you need to have from the top, if you can get it, then that would be uh, by far preferable, preferable of course. Um, feed uh, your existing data into knowledge graph to generate a new unified view. Uh, so build your ETL pipelines, uh, st just start with batch. Uh, uh, don't even think about uh, working with real-time data yet. Uh, well, that is, uh, let's say, the next level of maturity, and more about that later. And start delivering your first use cases. Uh, create a use case hierarchy, a use case tree, uh, where at the bottom of the tree you have your low-hanging fruit, uh, the easy pickings. Uh, for example, uh, start with reference data, I would say. Um, uh, you need you need to have the reference data, also the infrastructure uh, information, like uh, which systems <coughs> do you have? What is your inventory? What are your buildings, your locations, places, and things? Uh, people, units, uh, reporting lines, ownership, uh, uh, roles of people, etc. That's uh, that's a good place to start um, because then everything else relates to that and can be built on top of that. Um, and show that the results that come from the knowledge graph are, of course, uh, obviously um, uh, at least the same, uh, but pro probably better than what the cottage industry can uh, can provide. And I think uh, what what I've seen so far is that if you build those ETL pipelines and get your data from the source, and you do all your homework, you do all the right things, you validate, you transform, you enrich, uh, use even machine learning to enrich, all in the ETL pipeline. Then eventually, and, and then you uh, you validate with other data sets as well. Then you, you end up with a much higher level of quality uh, in the end result than what the original source system was providing you. So, doing that homework properly um, and ending up with uh, with with uh, with graph data that can be that is ready to be stored in the knowledge graph or to to or be presented in knowledge graph. That is uh, that is uh, straight, uh, yeah. That is value that uh, that that can that can make the business better. Um, and then eventually you can start talking about replacing parts of the cottage tree, uh, cottage industry, one use case at a time. So uh, if you talk about these holy grail uh, use cases. Um, we can uh, we have uh, real time intraday risk profiling, for example, analysis and reporting. That would be a holy grail use case, uh, including uh, real time reporting to regulators, uh, creating a uh, basically regulatory reporting uh, as a service. Uh, because if you start building up all this, all this, uh, what Mike just said, uh, using the network effect, you, you, yeah, you create this critical mass of data that can be reused uh, uh, for, for many different use cases, then eventually uh, many reports, whether they are regulatory reports or any other report, can be generated with, uh, with ease. Um, or, and maybe even uh, yeah, fully, not, not fully automatic of course, but like can be uh, end users or subject matter experts can do it themselves. Um, unifying risk calculation across the, the whole organization, uh, like try to find all the abstractions. And I think uh, FIBO is, is doing part of that already, with, uh, but, but we, we don't, in FIBO don't have a proper uh, high level risk calculation ontology yet, uh, as far as I'm aware of. But um, I think uh, we, we would be able to uh, eventually provide this uh, bank wide view of, for example, what is our risk position across from the bank towards one global customer. 
Um, and eventually, if you have this data fabric, this data layer, enterprise data uh, knowledge graph uh, working as a, as, a, as a data facility, it's, it's almost like data as a utility, I would say. Uh, it's, it's out there in the cloud, um, in your internal cloud, um, at least. Um, then you would eventually also have much fewer breaks and uh, yeah, elevate the whole, uh, the whole operation uh, to a higher level. So here's this uh, maturity model that uh, we've been working on. It's kind of uh, stolen from CMM. Uh, we call this the enterprise uh, knowledge graph uh, maturity model. Um, let's, let's say most people are, are, might be at uh, level zero uh, yet, but uh, starting, uh, uh, th this is for when you are already on the roadmap towards an enterprise knowledge graph, where level five is the nirvana level, where basically the whole bank is uh, is uh, is using the knowledge graph as the core, uh, and where AI is uh, taking business uh, complex business business decisions. Uh, level one, where you start, is just build your first minimal viable product, uh, get a product like Stardock uh, in in house, uh, onboard your data sources, um, and and bring it together in one place and deliver uh, the the first few use cases uh, in production, and and provide value. And then the next step is um, start building that up as a real platform, uh, building out your uh, authentication, authorization, knowledge graph based authorization, uh, and not, not just based on role based access control, but basically used leverage the knowledge graph's knowledge about who you are, where you are, who you're what your reporting lines are, what your ownership, uh, you own a system, so therefore you have access to that system. Um, all of that knowledge can be leveraged to, to, to basically do a dynamic entitlement calculation. Um, then the next level, enterprise ready level, um, which is where tons of use cases are being used, uh, are, are making use of the, of the data that's provided by the enterprise knowledge graph. And then uh, level four, that's where you start uh, yeah, using all the data, this high quality data that the knowledge graph provides for enterprise level uh, AI. Um, and, and and start start using that for decision making. So, Jacobus, then, yes. Before you uh, move on to this last slide, yeah. I'm just going to launch another poll to see where the folks in the audience uh, are beyond the maturity model. To everyone, I encourage you to vote. You know, I'll report the results in a few minutes. Okay. Um, so given these five levels, um, you could start with, I would say start with creating a use case tree, um, which is how do you define what a use case is? Don't, don't think in terms of systems anymore. Forget about uh, system centric way of thinking in that sense. Uh, try to, to step out of your, uh, your business in, 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 in that sense a little bit. Uh, like a top-down top down view, a helicopter view of your business, look at the data. What is the data that you need to implement a certain use case and to implement a certain set of functions um, in terms of epics and user stories, literally. Uh, a use case in, the, in this sense is basically a collection of epics and user stories in an agile, in an agile sense. Um, but in order to be able to implement such a use case uh, with that given set of user stories, what, is the, what would be the data that you would need uh, to, to do that? And if you then cluster those use cases in a tree, where at the top of the tree in level five, you're talking about the holy grail use cases like uh, enterprise-wide risk management, for example, or um, a real client 360, um, then you can break that down into smaller use cases. Um, like client 360, a sub-use case of client 360 would be KYC, and a sub-use uh, sub use case of KYC would be uh, like uh, you, you need, for example, your your reference data for countries uh, or your the people or the customer uh, the customer uh, uh, contact list, etc. There's all kinds of sub-use cases that you can start with, and eventually you end up with use cases that you can build on uh, at level one. You just start with those. Um, and at, at actually, you can do it from both. Uh, you can do it top down and bottom up. Um, but actually, in, in at level five, all those use cases are blurred together. It's basically one big Venn diagram of overlapping, uh, overlapping use cases because uh, 
firm-wide anti-money laundering would uh, probably rely a lot on all the data provided by the client 360 use case. Um, and um, uh, the same for risk management. They're all heavily overlapping in that sense, utilizing each other's data. Uh, but, but if you think about it logically and you see it as a tree, then you can then plot that tree on a roadmap um, and, uh, and start delivering value for each of those use cases. When you deliver all those epics, then you have delivered real business value. Right? So, and that is, uh, that is the end of my, uh, my talk. Mike, uh, you take over the, the screen. Yep. Thanks, Jacobus. Um, we have a few minutes left before we get into the QA. So um, I'll start before we, we do that, um, just with the poll results. It looks like a lot of you, a little over half actually, are kind of at the maturity level one stage building MVPs. Almost everyone else is at the haven't begun stage. Uh, hopefully a lot of y'all who are in that bucket are planning on moving up to the MVP stage and a couple people reported being at uh, later stages in the maturity model. So very interesting, I appreciate everyone participating in that poll and the other ones that we launched uh, throughout the webinar. First case study we'll do um, was a Knowledge Graph at FINRA. <clears throat> so I suspect most, if not all of you are familiar with FINRA. Um, you know, they built the Knowledge Graph to support their uh, case investigators. So they connected over three dozen proprietary systems into a knowledge graph that yielded over a half a billion facts about their domain. And these case agents have a kind of custom built user interface that lets them dive through the knowledge graph that they've put together from all these different systems that lets them investigate, you know, potential bad actors within the U.S. financial system. And this has really been a big win for them because those systems were previously disconnected and they were able to bring together that data in kind of a new and interesting way. And it has been you know, very effective for their case managers, their case agents to better leverage the data that they already had. Next up is you know, a top US bank. They started with SR14 compliance is kind of their starting small. Um, they didn't attack one of the Holy Grail use cases necessarily first, um, but being able to bring together all the different places that information about bank liquidity was stored and pour them into a knowledge graph. And that ended up being the platform from which they could build other kind of regulatory compliance use cases to better support you know, the demands placed on the bank from regulators. Next up, uh, another bank, not quite a financial use case, um, but building an, a knowledge graph around IT asset infrastructure, um, <clears throat> mapping out the physical assets within the IT world, servers, networks, switches, applications, being able to plot those out as a graph all that information was maintained in a variety of different systems. So that ended up serving as use case that you kind of said, you get those use cases start blurring together as you get further up the maturity model. And you know, that's what kind of happened here. The original goal was just to do kind of outage reporting and understand if, if a network switch goes down, what applications are affected. But then, you know, those applications support business processes. So you can do disaster planning, or understand how a data center might lie in the critical path for delivering liquidity information to federal regulators. Um, yeah, yeah. The, one of those holy grail use cases is is uh, is w what I would call the technology supply chain, uh, or showing uh, you, you deliver a product or a service to a customer, uh, let's say a global customer. Um, and uh, in order to see what the impact is of certain events, uh, like it, it, it goes out, I think I identified 14 different levels uh, all the way at the lowest level, it's IP addresses communicating with each other, then protocols, data flows, or the information flows, um, project dependencies, budget dependencies, uh, jurisdiction dependencies, uh, legal dependencies. 
Um, and so you have all these different, basically there's a whole, uh, yeah, 14 at least uh, different dependency graphs uh, linking uh, all the assets of the bank uh, to delivering one particular service or product to a customer. Uh, so do we deliver on the right SLA? Can, can we even deliver, can we prove that we delivered on the SLA? Uh, is, is it at risk? What are the risk factors? Um, th those kinds of questions, I think that's a holy uh, grail use case in itself. I don't think that any bank can uh, can answer these questions uh, at that level uh, yet, but uh, it, it's certainly possible uh, to do this with uh, enterprise knowledge growth. Excellent. Well, I, I think Jacobus, that's a good segue into um, encouraging folks to reach out uh, if they want to learn more. You can go to Agnos's website, sign up for their newsletter, learn more about the maturity model use cases of knowledge graph. You can head to the Stardog website and be able to try out a knowledge graph for yourself for the folks who identified themselves as not yet begun their, their journey with the knowledge graph uh, and get on that maturity model at level one. Uh, you can grab Stardog today and begin that journey yourselves. So we have about 10 minutes left together. Um, we'll jump into the Q and A. Um, just before we start that, I want to remind everyone at the bottom of the screen, there's a little Q&A button that you can submit your questions now. <clears throat> Jacobus, uh, I think this first one's probably for you. Uh, what's the biggest delusion that banks have regarding their data? Um, well, there are several uh, delusions, I would say, but again, one, one big one is a uh, single version of the truth uh, or one canonical model. Um, I think that, that, that is a delusion uh, um, in, the, in the sense that people uh, make it too uh, straight. Like, of course, it's good to strive towards finding one model and one uh, single version of the truth, uh, but why do your, do your systems have to be enforced to do so. Um, so the enterprise knowledge graph, uh, uh, the last one that we built, uh, uh, supports multiple versions of the truth as a concept from the ground up, uh, as a fundamental uh, feature of the of the technical architecture, where we do identity resolution and property resolution in ETL pipelines, etc. But but not the value resolution. So you might end up with uh, with all the different versions of the truth in terms of their value. Um, in the knowledge graph uh, next to each other, uh, so that you can always provide the right version of the truth for the right context. Um, and so um, th th I think, and that is a much more flexible way of doing things because it allows you to yeah, to, to quickly adopt, uh, like uh, you don't have to hardwire and hard code all those decisions of what is the right version of the truth in which context exactly. Uh, that, that you can do that in a silo, you can get away with that in a silo because there's only one context in that silo that is relevant. But if you want to create reusable data at an enterprise level, then you, who decides what the, context, what the right context is? Uh, that's, that's not possible. So I think that is a fundamental uh, different way of thinking is to, is to basically embrace the diversity of your, uh, embrace all the, the fact that you have uh, all these different shapes of data and that it, and it will never go away. Uh, just deal with it. And, 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 the, and the enterprise knowledge graph will deal with it, like as we build it, it is actually dealing with it. Excellent. Uh, next question, one of the poll results we had when we asked folks about data challenges, the number three response was executive buy-in. So we had a question, how do you sell this to the C-level? How do you get around the pushback? Um, you know that you may ultimately get around data lakes, and you know how can knowledge graph help? In this yeah, area? well, can, can this, there are so many new paradigms that come together in this. Um, it, this is not something you can explain in uh, in half an hour, um, especially not at sea level. Um, so you need to uh, yeah, do some education in that sense, some, some consulting. Uh, I, I would, uh, but one, what, one of the things that we do for, for several customers is uh, we organize a workshop where we get um, a free day workshop, for example, where we get all the stakeholders in, uh, in the room 
and start explaining to them in business terms on what is an enterprise knowledge graph, how would what business benefits would be uh, could be delivered with that, uh, why would you want this, why is this uh, yeah an, 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 a fundamental change in in the way of thinking, and why would you even want it. Um, and then uh, try to discuss this uh, high level uh, use case tree, uh, like these are the things that, what, what are your holy grails, uh, how can we get there? Uh, and, and we're not saying that you can implement those holy grail use cases in, in one year or two years even, like it, it might take three or four years, but think ahead. Um, like be, be ambitious in that sense. Uh, eventually we will implement them. But how do we get there? What is your roadmap? Um, and how do you or structure that roadmap? And why? And how? And, and how do we get out of this mess, basically? Um, and and try to to yeah get everyone to in the room to discuss to di discuss that. Um, and not necessarily in technical terms, but in just in what do we want as a business? Um, so yeah, that's that's what I would suggest. Yeah, I think just to quickly add to what you said, Jacobus. Um, you know, the person asked the question, specifically mentioned Data Lake, and I, I think Data Lake have, has promised to solve some of the challenges around bridging silos and bringing data together. Um, but I think the thing to keep in mind where knowledge graphs differ, Jacobus talked a lot about it, is leaving data in place, not interrupting business as usual. The Data Lake is just kind of a, a formless void, and you know, that's perhaps the biggest part of the challenge that data scientists face. They're the ones stuck holding the bag, trying to make sense of what effectively is just a pile of data. It's a pile of data without any, um, it's, it's, it's disconnected from its meaning. Like uh, the, the meaning is stored somewhere else, if it's even stored or even documented. Lots of data is dumped in a data lake, I think, that is, has no documentation whatsoever. Uh, you just have to reverse engineer it, basically. Uh, so what we are saying, uh, rather than having a data lake with dump data, try to create a data lake with smart data, with RDF data, where you have a machine readable definition of the meaning of each and every data point. Yeah, it's an excellent point. So next question um, for you. One of the reasons that to have silos are, are the limitations to queries and consuming the data from existing systems or databases. So for example, you know, big OLAP queries cannot compete with online transactions. So the tension between OLAP and OLTP. I mean, even with Knowledge Graph, I'm still creating some silos, right? How do you see this problem with the proposal of a Knowledge Graph? Yeah, but you, you, you can, of course, uh, have OLTP and OLAP uh, use cases. But what basically what the Enterprise Knowledge Graph uh, as a platform does is to try to abstract all of that away from you. It's like having the diff so you're in the restaurant or you're in the kitchen. In the restaurant, you have this perfect view on your plate. That is your data. Uh, but how that data is created, that happens in the kitchen. Um, and, and whether you have OLTP data or OLAP data or whatever else, uh, that is basically, for the, from a business perspective, not really relevant anymore. Uh, so we create that illusion almost, uh, like, like the internet is. The, like if you go Google, then you're basically interacting with millions of systems, potentially, without even knowing it. Um, because you, you get all that data, uh, we are doing the same thing for for whatever the semantic web, basically for all your data. Make it create a Google for banks in that sense. Uh, uh, literally, what we could do at BMO Mellon is uh, search for all the data that was onboarded in the knowledge graph, uh, as if you do it at Google. Um, so you, you create that the separation between all those technical questions like uh, how do we deal with real time data or OLTP data or OLAP data. From the, from the business perspective, looking at the knowledge graph, it's all one thing. It's all one, it's all coming together in one place, even if it's real-time data. Great, thank you. I think we have time for maybe one or two other questions. We have many that we won't get to, uh, so we will make sure we follow up with everyone who had questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. Um, Here's a, here's a good one though to maybe your final question. What are the common ways folks visualize their knowledge graph data in Stardog or with other viz and workflow tools? So I, I know from you know, our experience, a lot of the folks who end up building knowledge graphs 
tend to use kind of the canonical node and edge visual, visualization for corner office demos. Uh, but more often than not, the production system ends up being something that's purpose built for a use case uh, because end users need a good user experience and a generic nodes and edges diagram isn't that. Is, is that what you're also seeing, Yukobis? Yeah, they are, I think many people uh, make the mistake, I think, to look at knowledge graphs in terms of those pictures. Um, uh, that that's not it. Like that's just one visualization of your data, uh, but but in most cases it's not a really useful visualization, and, and most people uh, just want to form on the on the screen. Um, and in that sense, it's uh, the the knowledge graph can be seen as let's say one giant uh, uh, data warehouse. And if you, if you want to build your dashboards on top of that, you can still do that. You can, for example, put. Uh, a tableau in front of a starter database. It can also create extracts, uh, generate, uh, especially if you have cloud architects, you can generate um, a MySQL database on the fly uh, almost, uh, or use Athena or have real, uh, real time access. Like if you want to have a relational view of the data uh, with your dashboard tool, uh, your BI tool, et cetera, like uh, Tableau, ClickSense, et cetera then you can still do that. There's nothing that stops you from doing that. Uh, but then it would be based on the high quality data from the knowledge graph rather than low quality data from one particular silo. Perfect. And with that, we're unfortunately out of time. 